Oversee Under Stone, Day 3, Part 1. Wherever they went to the ground floor of the house, they found the same thing. The doors of bookcases had been ripped off, and the books tumbled off the shelves into a chaotic jumble on the floor. Every locked door or cupboard had been forced, and the papers from inside scattered wildly about. Even in the breakfast room, half of a dozen elderly cookery books had been scattered from a shelf. I don't understand this, Father says slowly. This place is practically wrecked, but one or two obvious things that are clearly valuable haven't been touched. That statuette on the mantelpiece there, for instance, and that big silver cup on the sideboard in front of the room, in the front room. There doesn't seem any point to it at all. Someone was rejoicing in destruction, Barney said solemnly. Simon said slowly, it must have made an awful noise. Why didn't it wake us up? We're two floors away, Barney said. You can't hear anything up there. I like, I like this. It's mysterious. I don't, Jane shivered. Imagine someone wandering a about down here all night while we were asleep upstairs. It gives me the creeps. Perhaps there there wasn't anyone, Barney said. Don't be an idiot. Of course there was. Or do you think all the books jumped off the shelves? It needn't have been human. It might have been one of those special sort of ghosts that throws things about just for fun. A polter, a polter, poltergeist, said Father absently. He was opening all the silver cupboards to see if anything had gone. There you are, one of those. Well, Mrs. Polk says the house is supposed to be haunted, Jane said. Oh, dear. They all looked at one another round-eyed and suddenly shivered. Mother said, appearing suddenly in the doorway and making them all jump. Well, it's the first ghost I've ever heard of who wore crepe soled shoes. Dick, come and have a look out here. Father straightened up and followed her out into the kitchen with the children close at his heels. Mother pointed without a word. Two kitchen windows were open, the big one over the sink and a small one above it, and so was the door. And on the flat white tiles of the tabletop beside the sink, there was the faint but unmistakable outline of a footprint. A large footprint with bar markings across the sole and traces of the same markings on the windowsill above. Gosh, there's your ghost, Father said cheerfully, though he did not look cheerful at all. Then he turned on them briskly. Now come on, all of you, off upstairs and get dressed. You've seen all there is to see. No, he waved his hands as all three children began to protest vigorously. This isn't a game. It's extremely serious. We shall have to call the police, and I don't want anything touched before they arrive. Off. Oh. Father had one voice which stopped all argument, and this was it. Simon, Jane, and Barney trailed reluctantly out of the kitchen door and along the hall and then stopped, stooped, or stopped, still at the foot of the stairs looking up. Great Uncle Mary was heavily descending the stairs towards them, clad in a pair of brilliant red pajamas and with his white hair all standing up on end. He was yawning prodigiously and rubbing his eyes in a puzzled kind of way. Won't do, he was muttering to himself. Can't make it out. Heavy sleep. Most unusual. Then he caught sight of the children. Good morning, he said with dignity, as if he were fully and impeccably dressed. Befuddled, though I am this morning, a great clamor has been penetrating up the stairs from down here. Is anything wrong? We've had burglars, Simon, Simon began, but Father came strutting out after them from the kitchen and clapped his hands. Come on, come on, I told you, go and get dressed. Oh, good. There you are, Mary. The most extraordinary thing has happened. He glared at the children, and they hastily ran upstairs. After breakfast, the police arrived from St. Austell, a solid red-faced sergeant and a very young constable following him like a mute shadow. Simon was looking forward to eager questions about his discovery of the crime. At the very least, he thought vaguely, he would have to make a statement. He was not quite sure what this meant, but it sounded familiar and important. But the sergeant only said to him, his warm Cornish accent stroking the words, Came down first, did ya? Yes, that's right. Touch anything? No, not a thing. Well, I did straighten the barometer. It was crooked. Look, <clears throat> looking around at the chaos, Simon thought how silly this sounded. Ah, you hear anything? No. All quite as usual, eh? Apart from the mess? Yes, it was really. Ah, said the sergeant. He grinned at Simon, sitting eagerly on the edge of his chair. All right, I'll let it off this time. Oh, said Simon. Oh, said Simon, deflated. Is that all? I reckon so, the sergeant said placidly, tugging his jacket down over his stout middle. Now, sir, he said to Father, if we might take a look at this footprint you say you found. Yes, of course, Father led them out to the kitchen. The children, drifting behind, peeped through the door. The sergeant gazed impassively at the footprint for some moments, said to his speechless constable, now take good note of that, young George, and move ponderously out to the disorder of the living room. You say there seems to be nothing gone, sir? Well, it's difficult to tell, of course, since it's a rented house, Father said, but certainly nothing valuable seems to be missing. The silver's all intact, not that there's much of it anyway. That cup, as you see, wasn't touched, but they seem to go for the books, and I can't vouch for those. There may well be some missing and that we don't know about. 
"'Tis a proper mess, surely," the sergeant bent down with some effort and picked up a book. A small deflated black cobweb lay along the top of its pages. "'Very old, these, valuable, maybe. Quite well off, the captain is, I believe. If I might suggest, sergeant, Great Uncle Mary said diff different, <coughs> definitely from the edge of the group. What is it, Professor? The sergeant beamed at him all over his rosy countryman's face. Even he seemed to know Great Uncle Mary's inexplicably well. I had no chance to look very thoroughly, since most of the bookcases were locked, but I should have said that very few of the books in this house were valuable, to a dealer at any rate. None of them was worth more than a few pounds at the outside. Funny, they seem to have been looking for something. Hey, look here. The sergeant shifted aside some of the papers whitening the floor. They saw a pile of empty picture frames. Those are from the hall, Simon said at once. That bumpy gold frame had a map in it at the top of the stairs. Hmm, no map in it now. All of them been ripped out. Still, I dare say we will find them somewhere in all this clutter. The ser sergeant rocked to and fro on his heels, gazing with an expression of mild regret at the battered bookcases and piles of books. He rubbed one of his shiny silver buttons thoughtfully and finally turned to father with an air of decision. Sheer hoo hooliganism, I reckon, sir. Can't be no other explanation. Seldom is round these parts anyway. Ah, said the young constable regretfully and immediately turned crimson and looked down at his feet. The sergeant beamed at him. Someone with a grudge against the captain, I dare say, having a go at his belongings. Might well be one or two people here about don't like him. He's a funny old bird. Wouldn't you say so, Professor? You might call him that, Great Uncle Mary said abstractedly. He was standing looking about him and with a puzzled frown. Breaking in, in difficult in a place with the size of terrific, the sergeant said. People don't expect it. They leave their windows open. Did you lock up last night, Dr. Drew? Yes, I always do. Back and front. Father scratched his head. I could swear there weren't any windows open downstairs, but I must admit I didn't go round trying them all. Well, no, you wouldn't expect this sort of thing. Beats me why anyone should want to take the risk just to rough the place up and not pinch anything. Now, if I could have one more look at that print. He hit, led the way out of the room. Simon beckoned Jane Barney to stay behind. Hooligans, he thought thoughtfully. He picked up a book that lay sprawled open, face downwards on the carpet, and shut its covers gently. It doesn't sound right somehow, Jane said. It's all so thorough. Every drawer open and almost every book taken down. And every map taken out of its frame, said Barney. It's just the maps. Have you noticed? None of the pictures. The burglars must have been looking for something. And they went on through the house because they couldn't find it. Perhaps it wasn't down here, Simon said slowly. Well, it couldn't have been upstairs. How do you know? Don't be silly. There just isn't anything upstairs except us, isn't there? Isn't there? Well, Jane said, and then suddenly they were all three looking at one another in horror. They turned and dashed out of the room and up the stairs to the second floor bedroom where the great square wardrobe stood between Simon and Barney's beds. Simon hastily dragged a chair forward and up and jumped up on it to feel round on top of the wardrobe. His face went blank with alarm. It's gone. There was a fearful moment of silence. Then Jane sat down with a bump on Barney's bed and began to giggle hysterically. Stop it, Simon said sharply, sounding for a moment as authoritative as his father. Sorry, it's all right. It hasn't gone, Jane said weakly. It's in my bed. In your bed? Yes, I've got it. It's still there. I clean forgot. Jane babbled, then pulled herself together. When I went to see the visor, I didn't want to take it with me. I had to hide it somewhere in my room, so I shoved it right down under the bedclothes. It was the nearest place. Then last night I forgot it was there and I must have gone to sleep without feeling it. Come on. The front bedroom was full of sunlight and through the window the sea sparkled as merrily as if nothing could ever disturb the world. Jane held back the sheet of her rumpled bed and there, tucked in a corner at the bottom, was a telescope case. They perched in a row on the edge of the bed and Jane opened the case on her lap. They stared in silent relief at the familiar hollow cylinder of the old manuscript inside. Do you realize, Simon said gravely, this was the safest place it could possibly have been? They could have looked anywhere else, but not in your bed, without waking you up. You don't think they came up and looked in our rooms? Barney turned pale. They might have looked anywhere. Oh, but this is silly, Jane, Jane swung her ponytail as if she were trying to clear her head. How on earth could they have known anything about the manuscript at all? We found it in the attic, all hidden away, and it had obviously been there for years and years. And no one can even have been up in the attic for ages. Think of all that dust on the stairs. I don't know, Simon said. There's lots of things I don't understand. I only know I've been feeling funny about the manuscript ever since you said that the vicer of yours got all excited about the copy of the map. Jane shrugged. I don't see how a vicer could be bad. Anyway, he didn't know about the manuscript. He asked a few questions, but I think he was just being nosy. Wait a minute, Barney said slowly. I remembered something. There was someone else he asked him questions. It was Mr. Withers on the boat yesterday. 
when I was down in the cabin with him getting lunch. He started saying a lot of peculiar things about the gray house, and to tell him if we saw anything that looked very old. Any, he swallowed. Any old books or maps or papers. Oh, no, Simon said. It couldn't have been him. But whoever it was, said Barney in a small, clear voice, they were, they were looking for the manuscript, weren't they? Sitting there in the silence of the gray house, they all three knew that it was the truth. They must want it awfully bad, Simon looked down at the manuscript. It's that map part. That's what it is. Someone, somehow someone knows it's in the house. Oh, I wish we knew what it said. Look here, Jane said, making up her mind. We've got to tell Mother and Father about finding it. Simon stuck his chin out. It wouldn't do any good. Mother would be worried stiff. Anyway, don't you see? We shouldn't have a chance to work it out, out ourselves then. And suppose it does lead to buried treasure. I don't want to find any beastly treasure. Something horrible is bound to happen if we do. Barney forgot his fright and outraged ownership. We can't tell anyone about it. We found it. I found it. It's my quest. You're too young to understand, Jane said pompously. We shall have to tell someone about it, father or the policeman. Oh, do you see? She added plaintively. We've got to do something after last night. Children! Mother's voice came from the stairs outside, very close. They jumped guiltily to their feet at once, and Simon held the manuscript behind his back. Hello? Oh, there you are. Mother appeared in the doorway. She looked preoccupied. Look, the house is going to be chaotic all this morning. Would you like to go out swimming and come home for a late lunch, about 1.30? Then this afternoon, Great Uncle Mary wants to take you all out. Fine, Simon said, and she vanished again. That's it, Barney thumped the pillow in excitement and relief. That's it, of course. Why didn't we think of it before? We can tell someone and still have things all right. We can tell Great Uncle Mary. Chapter 6 Now then, said Great Uncle Mary as they strode down the hill to the harbor. It's a splendid afternoon for a walk. Which way do you want to go? Somewhere lonely, somewhere miles from anywhere, somewhere where, where we can talk. Great Uncle Mary looked down at them, from one strained face to the next. His bleak, impressive expression did not change, and he simply said, very well, and lengthened his stride so that they had to trot and keep up. He asked no questions, but walked in silence. They climbed the wind winding little street on the side of the harbor opposite Kamar Head, <coughs> Kamar Head in the Gray House, and followed the cliff path path past the last straggling house of the village until the great purple green sweep of the opposite headland rose before them. Up the slope they toiled, through the heather and prickling gorse, past rough outcroppings of the gray rock patched yellow with lichen and weathered by the wind. There had been no breath of a breeze and a weather <coughs> down in the harbor, but here the wind was loud in their ears. Gosh, Barney said, pausing and turning outwards to look down. Look! They turned with him and saw the harbor far below and the gray house tiny on the, th on the threading road. Already they were higher than their own headland, and still the rock scarred the slope stretched above them to meet the sky. They turned again and scrambled up the slope, and at last they were at the top of the headland with the line of the surf laid out like a slow-moving map below them on either side, and beyond it the great blue sweep of the sea. One big slanting boulder of granite stood higher than any they had passed on the way up. And Great Uncle Mary sat down with his back against it, his legs arched up before him, long and knobbly, in their flapping brown corduroys. The children stood together, looking down. The land before them was unfamiliar, a silent secret world of mounded peaks and invisible valleys, all its colors merging in a haze of summer heat. Hick and Ickbuk Regnum Malogri, Great, Un Great Uncle Mary said, looking out with, <coughs> out with them across it all, as if he were reading out an inscription. What does that mean? Here begins the realms of Logers. Now come on, the three of you, and sit down. They squatted down beside him in a semicircle before the big rock. Great Uncle Mary surveyed them as if he were enthroned. Well, he said gently, who tells me what's wrong? In the quiet, with only the sound of the wind stirring the, the air, Jane and Barney looked at Simon. Well, it was the burglar, he said haltingly. We were worried, and then the three of them were all tumbling out the words. When Miss Withers came the other night, she was asking questions about the Grey House and whether we found anything. And so did Mr. Withers on their yacht. He asked me about old books. And whoever it was last night, they only touched the books and all the old maps. They were looking for it. They must have been. Only they didn't know where to look, and they didn't know we already had it. Suppose they know we've got it. They might come after us. Great Uncle Mary raised one hand, though he did not move. His chin was up. He looked as if he were waiting for something. Gently now, he said. If you have found something in the gray house, what is it you have found? Simon felt inside the rucksack. He drew out the case and handled handed the parchment to Great Uncle Mary. We found this. Great Uncle Mary took the parchment without a word and gently unrolled it on his knees. He gazed at it in silence for a long while, and they could see his eyes moving over the words. The wind on the headland whined softly round them, and although as they watched, Great Uncle Mary's expression did not change. They suddenly knew that some enormous emotion was flooding through him, like an electric current. 
It tingled in the air, exciting and frightening at the same time, though they could not understand what it was. And then he raised his head at last and looked out across the hills of Cornwall, rolling far into the distance, and he breathed a great sigh of relief that was like a release from all the worry of the whole world. Where did you find it? he said, and the three children jumped at the quiet, quiet, ordinary tone of his voice as if it brought them out of a spell. In the attic? There's a great big attic, all full of dust and junk. We found a door behind our wardrobe and a staircase leading up. I found it, Barney said. I threw my apple core away and I went to get it back because the rat because of the rats. I found the manuscript by accident in a corner under the floor. What is it, Gamary? What does it say? It's terribly old, isn't it? Is it important? Is it about buried treasure? In a way, Great Uncle Mary said, his eyes seemed dazed, unable to focus anywhere, but there was a twitching at the corners of his mouth. Somehow, without smiling, he looked happier than he had ever they, they had ever seen him before. Look. Jane thought, watching. It is a sad face, usually, and that's why there's such a difference. He laid the manuscript down on his lap and looked from Jane to Simon to Barney and back again. He seemed to be searching for words. You have found something that may be more important than you could possibly realize, he said at last. They stared at him. He looked away again over the hills. You remember the fairy stories you were told when you were very small, once upon a time? Why do you think they always begin began like that? Because they weren't true, Simon said promptly. Jane said, caught up in the unreality of the high, remote place. Because perhaps they were true once, but nobody could remember when. Great Uncle Mary turned his head and smiled at her. That's right. Once upon a time, a long time ago, things that happened once, perhaps, but have been talked about for so long that nobody really knows. And underneath all the bits that people have added, the magic swords and lamps, they're all about one thing. The good hero fighting the giant, or the witch, or the wicked uncle. Good against bad. Good against evil. Cinderella. Aladdin. Jack the Giant Killer, and all the rest. He looked down again, his fingers caressing the curving edge of the parchment. Do you know what this manuscript is about? King Arthur, Barney said promptly, and King Mark. Simon found the names in Latin. And what do you know about King Arthur? Barney looked round triumphantly at his captive audience and drew a breath for a long recital, but somehow found himself stammering instead. Well, he was a king of England, and he had knights of the round table, Lancelot and Galahad, Galahad and Kay and all of them, and they fought joust and rescued people from wicked knights and arthur beat everyone with a sword excalibur it was a good against bad i suppose like you said about fairy stories only he was real great uncle mary's quiet pleased smile was flickering again and when was arthur king of england well barney waved his hand vaguely a long time ago like in the fairy stories jane said he finished for him i see but gamary what are you trying to tell us was king arthur a fairy story too no, Barney said indignantly. No, said Great Uncle Mary. He was real, but the same thing has happened, do you see? He lived such a long time ago that there's no record of him left, and it's so become he's become a story, a legend as well. Simon fidgeted with the strap of his rucksack, but I don't see where the manuscript comes in. The what the wind over the headland stirred Great Uncle Mary's white hair outlined against the sky, and as he glanced down he looked me <coughs> magisterial and severe. Patience a little, and listen carefully now, because you may find this difficult to understand. First of all, you have heard me talk of Logers. It was the old name for this country thousands of years ago in the old days when the struggle between good and evil was more bitter and open than it is now. That struggle goes all around us all the time, like two armies fighting, and sometimes one of them seems to be winning and sometimes the other, but neither has ever triumphed altogether. Nor ever will, he added softly to himself, for there is something of each in every man. Sometimes, over the centuries, this ancient battle comes to a peak, the eagle, evil grows very strong and nearly wins, but always at the same time there is some leader in the world, a great man who sometimes seems to be more than a man, who leads the force of good to win back the ground, and the men they seem to have lost. King Arthur, Barney said. King Arthur was one of these, Great Uncle Mary said. He fought against the men who wanted logers, who robbed and murdered and broke all the rules of battle. He was a strong and good man, and the people of those days trusted him absolutely. With that faith behind him, Arthur's power was very great, so great that in the stories that have grown up since, people have talked about his having magical help, but magic is just a word. I suppose he didn't win, Jane said with sudden conviction, or there wouldn't have been any wars since. No, he didn't win, Great Uncle Mary said, and then, even in the clear afternoon sunshine, he seemed with every word to become more remote, as ancient as the rock behind him, and the old world of which he spoke. He wasn't altogether beaten. But he didn't altogether win. So the same struggle between good and evil sides has gone on ever since. But the good has grown very confused, and since the ancient days of Logers, it has been trying to regain the strength it was given by Arthur. But it never has. Too much has been forgotten. But those men who remembered 
the old world, have been searching for its secret ever since. And there have been others searching as well, the enemies, the wicked men, who have fought the same greed in their cold hearts as the men whom Arthur fought. Great Uncle Mary looked out into the distance, his head outlined against the sky, like the proud carved head of a statue, centuries old, and yet always the same. I've been searching, he said, for many, many years. The children stared at him, awed and a little afraid. For a moment he was a stranger, someone they did not know. Jane had a sudden fantastic feeling that a great Uncle Mary did not really exist at all, and would vanish away if they breathed or spoke. He looked down at them again. I was beginning to know that this part of Cornwall held what we sought, he said. I did not know that you children would be the ones to find it, or what danger you would be putting yourselves in. Danger, Simon said incredulously. Very great danger, said Great Uncle Mary, looking him in full, full in the face. Simon swallowed. This manuscript, Simon, puts you all right in the middle of the battle. Oh, nobody will stick a knife in your back. Their methods are more subtle than that, and perhaps more successful. He looked down at the manuscript again. This, he said more normally, is a copy. A copy, said Barney, but it's so old. Yeah, oh yes, it's old. About 600 years old. But it's a copy of something even older than that, written more than 900 years ago. The part at the beginning is in Latin. There, I said so, Jane said in triumph. Simon stuck out his lower lip. Well, I translated bits of it, didn't I? Not much, though, he confessed to Great Uncle Mary. I couldn't recognize any of the words. <clears throat> I don't suppose you could. This is medieval Latin, not like the Latin you learned at school. It's written by a monk who must have lived near here, and I think about 600 years ago, though there's no date. He says roughly that near the, his monastery, an old English manuscript has been found. He says it tells of an old legend from the days of Mark and Arthur, and that he has copied out the story to save its being lost, because the manuscript was falling to bits. He says he copied out a map that was with the manuscript, too, Then all the rest underneath is the story that he copied out, and you can see the map right at the bottom. If the original manuscript was so old that it was falling to bits 600 years ago, Barney said when used, Simon broke in impatiently. Dear Mary, can you understand the copied out part? That's not Latin, is it? No, it's not, Great Uncle Mary said. It's one of the early English dialects, the old language that used to be spoken centuries ago. But it's a very old form of it, full of words from the old Cornish and even some from Brittany. I don't know. I'm, I'll read it. Out, out as best I can, but I may turn it into rather curious English, and I may have to stop. He peered at the manuscript again, then stumbling and with many pauses while he held it to the sunlight or fumbled in his mind for a word, he began to read in his deep, faraway voice. The children sat and listened, with the sun hot on their faces and the wind still whispering in their ears. This I write, that when the time comes, it shall be found by the proper man and I leave it in the care of the old land that soon shall be no more. Into the land of Cornwall, the kingdom of Mark, there came in the days of my fathers a strange knight fleeing towards the west. Many fled hither in those days, when the old kingdom was broken by the invader and the last battle of Arthur was lost. For only in the western land did men still love God in the old ways. And the strange knight who came to the place of my fathers was called Bedwin, and he bore with him the last trust of Logers, the grail made in fe in the fashion of the Holy Grail, that told upon its sides all the true story of Arthur soon to be misted in men's minds. Each panel told of an evil overcome by Arthur and the company of God, until the end when evil overcame all. And the last panel showed the promise and the proof of Arthur's coming again. For behold, said the knight, Bedwin to my fathers, evil is upon us now, and so shall it be for time beyond our dreaming. Yet if the Grail, that is the last trust of the old world, be not lost. Then when the day is ripe, the Pendragon shall come again, and at last all shall be safe, and evil be, trust, be thrust out never to return. And so that the trust be kept, he said, I give it into your charge, and your sons, and your sons' sons, until the day's day come. For I am wounded near death from the last of the old battles, and I can do no more. And soon, and very soon he died, and they buried him over the sea and under the stone, and there he lies until the day of our Lord. And so the grail passed to my father's charge, and they guarded it in the land of Cornwall, where men still strove to keep alive the old ways. While in the east the men of evil grew more numerous, and the land of Logers grew dark, for Arthur was gone and Mark was dead, and the new kings were not as old as the old had been. And with each turn of years the grail came to the charge of the eldest son, and at the last it came to me. And since the death of my father, I have kept it safe as best I might, in secret and in true faith. 
But now I grow old and am childless, and the great, great, greatest darkness of all comes upon our land. For the heathen men of evil who came to the east in the years past and the slew, slew the Englishmen and took their land are turning westward now, and we shall not long be safe from them. The darkness draws toward Cornwall, and the long ships creak to our shore, and the battle is near, which must lead to final defeat and the end of all that we have known. No guardian for the grail is left, since my brother's son, whom I loved as my own, is turned already to the heathen men, and guides them to the west. And to save my life, and the secret of the grail that only its guardian knows, I must flee, even as Bedouin, the strange knight fled. But in all the land of Logers, no haven remains, so that I must cross the sea to the land where, they say, Cornish men have fled whenever terror comes. But the grail may not leave this land, but must wait, the Pendragon, till the day comes. So therefore I trust it to this land, over sea and under stone, and I mark here the signs by which the proper man in the proper place may know where it lies, the signs that wax and wane, but do not die. The secrets of its charge I may not write, but carry unspoken to my grave. Yet the man who finds the grail and has other words for me will know, by both, the secret for himself, and for him is the charge, the promise, and the proof, and in his day the Pendragon shall come again. And that day shall see a new Logos, with evil cast out, when the old world shall appear no more than a dream. Great Uncle Mary stopped reading, but the children sat as still and speechless as if his voice still rang on. The story seemed to fit so perfectly into the green land, rolling below them, that it was as if they sat in the middle of the past. They could almost see the strange night Bedouin riding towards them, over the brow of a slope, and the long ships of the invaders lurking beyond the gray granite headland and its white fringe of surf.